Caddis Maximus here, this time with the teardown of the Harbor Freight Bauer Super Hog two speed high power right angle drill. This is a, their big 13 amp beast. I've done a review on this, but never did a teardown. I want to do a little bit of a modification to it just because the vents are so. They just don't, they seem a bit restrict, restrictive in this convolution. Really seems like it's going to end up clogging with sawdust. Take a look at the big gears inside there. It's always fun to do that. And sometimes they don't put very much grease in there. And every once in a while they actually do. But a lot of modern tools, they actually are a bit conservative with the grease because uh, not so much weight, but it's just cost. If you ever take apart like old Milwaukee drills or something like that, you'll find that um, one of the reasons an old Milwaukee drill would last a long time is because I actually did put a ton of grease in the gearboxes. Let's go ahead and knock this handle apart first. And regarding the fasteners on this, they're all Phillips. They're not, uh, they don't seem quite as nice or as heavy duty as what would be on a genuine Milwaukee. That's one of the ways that they're uh, saving some uh, money. And another thing is these screws don't feel particularly tight at all. Those are really easy to pull out. Especially considering this is a 13 amp tool, do want to see if there's any. There is some information. Let me try to get a better look. It's a no name brand switch rated at 10 amps at 250 volts or 16 amps at 125 volts. So the trigger is properly rated, but it's not particularly overbuilt. For instance, the uh, traditional 13 amp warm 13 amp warm drive skill saw will have a switch that's rated for 22 amps. This is a little surprising. It was actually pretty easy to push the knife down right into the edge of that. I wasn't just going to show the time, but this plastic here, even though it's glass fiber reinforced, after I just cut that one little portion, these things even though they're little thin uh, you know ventilation guides it still seems just a little bit weak. I shouldn't be able to just so easily just break those off like that. But here's the idea. Now there's a lot of ventilation. And I'm not much less worried about debris getting in. Now I know that even under harsh conditions or, you know, in the summer, I'm going to have a little better chance of this motor staying reasonably cool. And that's what I get for not having a uh, real good positive uh, engagement. And those screws were indeed pretty tight. They have little lock washers and stuff on them. Let's get these others out of here. Always important to be nice and perpendicular when you're trying to pull out more stubborn Phillips screws. Now, of course, something like this is going to be have a little machined rings that helps keep it centered, so it's going to require just a little bit of effort prying around on the edges with the screwdriver. The boot kind of actually creates a little gap so you can slowly work this thing out of here. Well, my initial worries about amounts of grease uh, have been assuaged, assuaged, I don't know the term, but it's obviously just a very basic grease. It doesn't appear to be any kind of molybdenum or Teflon or uh, graphite grease because it doesn't have that dark color. It's just a straight up plain grease. So this is some grease that will work okay, but if you actually have one of these and you really do use it, you'll want to get in here and actually replace it. We can see that that is a huge gear right there. Yeah, this bevel gear is actually pretty righteous. If we go across the top, it's just, a, you know, three inches or something, probably some close metric measurement like that. And if we actually just look at the straight linear width of those teeth i mean just like that half whoop let me get on top of that there just a, under a half inch wide so that actually is pretty righteous that is pretty heavy duty and you can see this interesting design where they have this cup in there so that the bearing can sit deeper into the gear boxes so they can recess the chuck and uh there is an o-ring in there i'm actually pretty surprised that will go a ways for helping you know even a cheaper chinese Harbor Freight tool, having an O-ring preventing dirt from getting in and preventing the liquid, how grease works is it slowly actually releases oil that's emulsified in it, uh, and that will help prevent it from at least leaking out around the uh, bevel gear area where there is the highest lows, that's where the most gear reduction happens, and will help it, la how, eh, help it last a bit longer. 
and then once again we'll just take a close look and there is a pretty meaty needle bearing so it is true all ball needle bearing and then there's our bevel gear and that thing has some pretty thick teeth on it we don't know the exact grade of steel uh, but obviously it's going to be some pretty hard steel this may not be quite as good as maybe some more expensive manufacturers do I've generally learned my lessons here with these types of tools in the in regards to pulling out the brushes when I pull off the gearboxes about half the time the motor will just stay in the back of the housing and not really be an issue and half the time it will get the bearing will get stuck in the front diaphragm here and it'll all pull out and if you don't pull out the brushes they kind of get all tangled up there's a close look they do hard wire the brushes they're in an okay guide it's a brass guide what I thought was interesting is they're not using plastic. This is a, a little fiberglass PCB circuit board, which is going to be more heat resistant than the, a lot of the plastic backings. And I thought, well, that's relatively intelligent. And then they just have a clock spring that presses down on the back of it. There is a guide where the wire runs down. So these would be known as auto stop brushes, mainly because it will stop the spring from advancing the brush as well as the wire kind of catching. Actually, that's kind of neat because the, they're actually using a special all copper little uh, crimp terminal on the end of that braided wire. I can already tell this is going to be an issue on this drill and people are going to want to watch this. These screws, especially these upper ones which are longer, versus that gearbox screw, these are already uh, have settled where the plastic is scrunched down, compressed a little bit, and they've started getting loose. These lower screws are going to be constantly getting loose. Even if you lock tight them, that won't prevent the issue of the plastic getting compressed. This is one of those tools, and I've actually seen, you know, loose screws is something very few people actually check on a lot of tools. All, all, you know, half of the used tools I've ever bought have had loose fasteners, just nobody ever checks on them. You can see an O-ring to help seal this, which I am surprised about. We also see a very telltale uh, sign here the the input or actually it appears that all the gears at least on the front stage You can tell by their angle is their helical cut gears, and I think that's rather interesting The way that they're operate at least in a normal forward direction We can see that it's designed to take this gear and push it back Against the diaphragm or the housing here and there's its little back washer I should probably put it onto that gear and that's something I've only seen actually before, or it's rare tools. Usually, uh, DeWalt does it in their quarter drills. It's actually kind of surprising. Milwaukee uses, just usually uses a ball bearing in this spot to deal with the thrust load. So it's interesting to see them using uh, an actual dual needle bearing setup. Those are stamped HK needle bearings in there. But if we look around the little spindle here, we can see a cotton felt. Since the normal motor's operation would be this direction, and that's what uh, forces the gear this, side, this direction towards the, the uh, diaphragm because of the helix angle, it will also force oil and grease to also kind of get pumped up through the center of the spindle, getting into the fan and spinning it out. So they've tried to put in a felt seal, and I've seen this a few times, uh, just to help mitigate that. And I think there's this drill, you know, as far as most of the... I would say gross features and design functions, really, uh, it's all there. And I kind of like taking apart this stuff, and it's definitely interesting. So we're going to try to, what I'm suspecting here, is that I have to pull out the reverse switch before I'm able to, oh, that's unfortunate. They make this kind of complicated to take apart here. So after struggling th with this for a few minutes, because I really wanted to show everybody like the, the clutch setup that's in here, which is on this larger upper gear. Um, the way they assembled this is the drive gear for the chuck is press fit onto the end of the spindle. To keep this from wanting to rattle back and forth, what they've done is the bearing that's down here at the end, right where the bevel gear is, has a back plate that's been screwed down to trap it. Clip here that retains the gear change lever. And you just have to make sure the little pegs align with the slot. But I, always, I thought that was kind of odd. This is one of the oddest things I've seen. There we go. 
there is this very custom e-clip that's very greasy look at this thing it's, it's an e-clip with a wing on it that actually has a couple of holes so you can use like a little hook tool uh, otherwise that's all it is a giant e-clip then then we can just pull and that's actually a fairly beef, beefy reverse lever dual ball detents the actual reversing the peg is hardened steel and then this when you rotate and there's a little spring in there so you can see how that moves back and forth so when the dog teeth for when you're changing gears aren't lined up this just won't fully seat and will be against the spring tension when you rotate the gears this will snap forward locking it into place and it's a fairly elegant design uh, with yet again an o-ring so they're actually intending on some of this grease remaining in the tool <laughs> which will probably do wonders for gearbox life i don't know how this video got so long they always do on teardowns so just because you want to talk about a little of the engineering give people more details and just a voiceless video so i believe if I can get, I don't know if this one is also retained. It seems like it is. This clutch I can now relatively move up and down. But this gear down here really, there it goes. And so this is the exciting and super greasy. Now that we've got that, man, that's more than just super greasy. That's the definition of slathering. I'll be reusing some of that stuff. Try not to get a ton of it on the outside of the gearbox here. And then this, whatever this is trapped by, a portion of the gear change mechanism. Always nice to wear gloves. There are the splines to drive it. These are the actual dogs that I'm talking about that align or don't align, I should say. Now we can pull this out. Man. Oh, they stacked all the grease on top. They didn't jam a bunch in the bottom. Interesting. So they put all this in there and then just clobbered it from the top. I'll actually end up pushing some of this down there. So there's double needle bearing setup, needle thrust with needle lateral bearings. It's the very same down there. We can see this whole setup is all helical cut gears. Not too bad. This dog, which is the first and second gear, this actually interacts with a gear down in the bottom. I need to take off the glove to show you there. So essentially how this works is this reverse lever is sliding this collar back and forth. I showed the splines that are inside, and this has dog teeth on both sides. So they either engage with the small gear in the back, which this bigger gear turns, making it spin faster, or it slid forward, where it engages these dog teeth in the back of the clutch. That's why the clutch only works in first gear, is because it's just being entirely bypassed when you're in second gear. And then, of course, this small gear right here, is what's interacting just with the teeth cut directly on the body of this clutch housing. We can see that they did not use needle bearings on this clutch. They just used bronze uh, sleeve bearings, but that's okay because, and I see why they did that, because when this, if the first gear clutch is engaged and these bearings actually aren't spinning, it's moving at the same speed as the shafts, so all it's doing is acting as just a bushing to keep it centered, and so very little wear. And when you're in second gear, this clutch is spinning, but it has no load on it at all. It's just free spinning This because this and this will always be turning. It's just the output has been disengaged via the dogs, and so it free spins. Now, as far as how these are assembled, I assume this will have a snap ring on it. The, I don't... Yes, it does. So this is the part that you need a press and like an oxygen sensor socket or something like that large enough to press on the outside of this and hold it down while you remove the snap ring and then slowly release it because this clutch is going to have some really stout uh, springs inside it. We can even kind of see that here. See through the windows there's the springs and then you can almost see the ball bearings that are engaging with the output there. So that's what would happen is this outer ring would spin and make the clutch sound and these dogs wouldn't rotate. So anyway, I'm going to deal with a little bit of this grease here, but did want to do a teardown of this drill because this is be essentially how, what, how the super hog is made and to show one of the reasons, even with the Bowers, why these drills are so expensive is because just a mech, uh, this whole hardened steel machine part, just the clutch alone uh, is a tremendously expensive part. I mean, there's a ton of machining, hardening, 
uh, all sorts of parts associated with it, as well as just the outright size. They did make all this pretty heavy duty. I'm really pretty happy with this. These gears are all nice thick teeth, all helically cut, which is exactly what you would hope for. Almost forgot to uh, talk about the motor here. We can see, if I can get enough light, that they did lacquer the windings. They're not wrapped like an old tools where they would wrap them in cloth and then dip them. But these are still not bad. Since it's 13 amp, the wire is pretty darn thick. It is definitely heavy duty, but it is nice to see that they did dip the field there. And then if we take a look at the motor itself, one thing I will say is maybe I got lucky on this unit, but there's not much in the way. There's some balance cuts, but those are the only ones. Otherwise, this motor is uh, naturally balanced, at least to a slightly better degree than maybe uh, motors of the past were. Heavily lacquered. We can see that they did use welded contacts, which is nice. It's a more secure connection because they're not susceptible to thermal fatigue as the connections heat up and cool down on the type that they just fold over. Generally speaking, they're pretty reliable, but just not as reliable as actually having it stamped like that. Then we can see just a little bit of cloth wrapping just to help provide a little bit of extra protection to the wires. On grinders, this whole front end would just be totally guarded. But this still, you know, for a drill, isn't bad. And really considering the fact that it is... 13 amps, these wires are pretty heavy duty. So overall, the motor's not too bad. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Until next time, Caddis Maximus out.